Welcome to the first transdisciplinary seminar of uh, the fall semester. And I am extremely excited to see such a big group of people here uh, for several reasons. My name is Andrea Geyer. I'm a full-time faculty in fine arts. And this is our first official um, like course-long collaboration with um, the Verilis Center for Art and Politics and Karin Kuni, who's going to co-teach this seminar with me. And I want to welcome Karin and thank her for being available for that. And do you want to address anything or, or add? Well, just very briefly, I mean, I also express my delight at working with Parsons and the MFA program and Andrea Geyer in particular. Um, the Verilist Center, just as a very brief introduction, was found about 20 years ago, is situated at another division at the new school and makes, um, makes it as its task to identify pressing issues in society and then bring people together to talk about these issues from different perspectives. Um, we you know, look at uh, political issues, human rights issues, all uh, different um, ideas, and of course science comes up very, very often. So while the speakers in our panels, and usually is panel discussions, um, uh, consist of artists and performing and visual artists, we also very often have historians or um, sociologists or scientists or policy makers, and to um, institute this um, cross-disciplinary uh, discussion in a more formal way, such as this class allows uh, to, uh, for us to do, is really, really exciting for us. And briefly, um, the other important point about this is that it is a merger of what the Verily Center does, which is address um, the general public with ideas that happen here at the New School and in other um, institutions of learning. And for that reason, this lecture now that Tatiana Lubiewska will um, deliver in a few minutes is open to the public. And I don't know the students yet, but I think quite a few um, of you here in the audience are just coming to hear the lecture. We will then break for a few minutes. Yeah, I mean, the structure of the seminar, it's about an yes. hour, it's about an hour lecture um, that um, we would like everybody to commit to staying as respect to our speakers and also because it's a seminar class. And um, then there will be a Q&A, uh, public Q&A. And then after that, uh, we will take about a 10 minute break. And then the students who are registered in the seminar or interested to be registered in the seminar will return. And we will have a more personal discussion with Tatiana about what she presented. And also talk a little bit in depth about um, other requirements of the class. So that will come after the lecture. Um, one thing I also wanted to say that the the we, the idea of the seminar is that it will continue in the future, uh, always in the fall semester for sure, maybe also in the spring. Um, the theme art and science is something that was uh, directly motivated by uh, work that came up in our student body at Fine Arts and also across Parsons is something that is continually a question. Artists working with scientific forms of research and kind of endeavoring into all kinds of fields of science and I thought it was really important to actually not only always flirt with science but to have start a real dialogue with that discipline as artists and this is what the seminar is. So in the future we'll also try to very much address um, students needs in relation to what the collaborations, the transdisciplinariness of the seminar will bring to the community of Parsons. Um, I think this is all for the for the formal introductions. Um, I will hand over. I'm, I'm very very pleased to introduce Tatiana, who is not a stranger to quite some of you, because she is um, a graduate student in the fine arts um, program, and she predominantly works with painting. Um, it has come to my attention in the um, fall that, oops. I'm sorry, um, that she also has uh, a PhD in geophysics and is actually published uh, quite significantly in that area. And who could be a more a perfect um, introductory lecturer um, than somebody who has two lives in both of these fields? It's clear today she will, she will put on her suit as a, as a scientist and address us as such. Um, but of course, we all know she also is working in the fields of art. So we can unpack that in the Q&A later if people are interested into that. Um, she did read, did I say that? She did receive her PhD at Yale uh, University. So please help me welcome Tatiana.
What? Do that, so do that clock so that I keep track of time. Oh, I will. Um, um, you need okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks very much for coming, especially those of you who are not in the class. Thanks to Andre and Karen for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to the audience, to this audience of non-scientists. It's, it's really exciting. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Principles of Scientific Research with uh, Case Studies in Geophysics and Geochemistry. And I would like to start first with a um, short discussion on uh, what are the key elements or key aspects of empirical sciences. Empirical sciences are biology, chemistry, physics, all those sciences that uh, try to make a picture of the world outside, around us and um, deal with empirical data. So that, of course, excludes uh, mathematics or social sciences or political sciences. So I'm going to talk uh, only about empirical sciences here in this talk. Uh, empirical sciences are system of theories about nature. Those theories are partly derived from data and are generally consistent with data. And uh, I'm saying here that they are partly derived from data because there is still a uh, to this moment, there is still a considerable debate in general philosophy and philosophy of science about whether it is possible in general um, logically to construct a theory based solely on empirical data. So many people believe that it's not possible, that uh, there is always an element of deduction in con the construction of theories. But any theories uh, are constructed so that they are generally consistent with the data. And I'm saying here generally because there are always inconsistencies. And I'm going to talk about it in more details later. Empirical data are observations and experiments that are independently reproducible. So that means they are, um, the, f they are the phenomena that are seen by different people at different places at different times uh, in similar conditions. And that, of course, excludes things like say, hallucinations or uh, supernatural phenomena. Um, those phenomena are outside of the scope of sciences, or empirical sciences, at least. And the uh, general directions of direction of scientific research is uh, towards maximize, maximizing the conformity of the theories to the empirical data. And uh, my next slide, this cartoon, from Thomas Kuhn, say from late in the 70s, slightly changed. Um, I hope you'll help me to explain what I mean here. So you have uh, here, we have in the left part of the picture on top, the green box is a theory. And the yellow box at the bottom is experiment. Um, each scientific research or each project usually starts with formulating a theory. And um, from that theory based uh, through certain manipulation, uh, usually logic or math, we make certain predictions about world, about um, observable phenomena. And those predictions are usually quantified and the predictions then can be compared with the uh, measurements or results of experiment. Um, and there is always a misfit between theory and between th uh, theoretical prediction and experiment. And there are many causes for this misfit. On the one hand, if we are looking at the data, there is always a <coughs> limited precision to any kind of measurements whatsoever. So even if we are, if we are measuring something with a ruler, the uncertainty of our, of our measurements would be perhaps a, a one sixteenth of an inch. If we are using a microscope, there is also a limited un uncertainty to our measurements. Then, of course, there is also a limited number of observations. We cannot measure anything infinitely with infinite precision. So that brings um, the uncertainty to our data. And of course, there, is always a, there are always limits to our technology and to the uh, tools and apparatuses that we use in the laboratory. On the other hand, uh, no theory can explain a phenomena in all their complexities. Uh, so there are always um, certain assumptions uh, or limitations of the theories. We should always 
uh, we find that ne it necessary to always to neglect certain things or variables or uh, to simplify things and so on and so on. So, um, as I say, there are all these causes for the misfit between theory and experiments. So, in scientific research, when we see this kind of misfit, we are, have to go back both to the experiment and to the theory. We have to refine our measurements. We have to um, sometimes invent new instruments or collect more data on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have to go back to our theory and uh, refine our assumptions and sometimes uh, even discard one theory and propose some new theories altogether. So that's why um, I have these red arrows coming from theory to experiment and back again, because there is always a sort of oscillation, a back and forth movement between theory and, and results uh, and empirical data in any scientific research. And um, the general directions of uh, any research uh, then could be loosely divided in these four groups. The first group is just um, different ways of reducing the gap between uh, empirical data and theories, such as refining, as I said, refining theory, refining measurements, introducing new instrumentation, and so on and so on. Then there is always um, another direction, very important direction, is developing new application for the existing theories. It often happens in science that a uh, valid solution for certain problem in one field uh, may be found very useful in quite a different field. For example, um, there, there's been developed a, a very useful theory for explaining the movement of water in the pipes in hydrology. Then the same theory uh, was used um, in a very convenient way for explaining how magma and lava is moving in volcanoes or in magma chambers. Uh, so things like that then uh, sometimes it happens that a theory or a model has uh, applications in different fields, but there are certain inconsistencies between those results in the different subfields of science. And I'm going, it, I know it sounds very abstract, but I hope many things will be more clear when I start uh, explaining, um, start giving you examples from particular research. Mm, and by the way, please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions whenever you have some. <coughs> Um, well, and finally, of course, there is always a need for collecting new data. Uh, say in geosciences, uh, people ever try to develop new tools in, and instruments in order to reproduce in the laboratory high temperatures and pressures that exist in the middle of the earth uh, at the depth. All right, so with this introduction, I can now move to earth sciences or geosciences. And before I start talking about particular examples uh, of projects in which I was a participant, I first have to give you an overview of a theory. As I said, empirical sciences are sets of theories. And um, in all the mature sciences, uh, in all the contemporary sciences, there is always a theory about which there is a strong consensus among the scientists. So that, that's a theory that is a foundation of this science. So if you are entering this field and starting doing research, you have to agree with this theory and build from that. It very rarely happens that some new data appear that indicate that those fundamental theories may be wrong. But that's, that happens, but very rarely, for example, it happened in the beginning of the 20th century with the advent of uh, Einsteinian physics. So in earth sciences, such fundamental theory is called plate tectonics. It was developed um, in the first half of the 20th century. And before I go into it, I would like you to look at the cartoon in to the right. So this cartoon shows the structure, the inner structure of the solid earth. Um, you probably are familiar with it, but just to reiterate in the middle of the Earth, there is a metal core, a uh, core made of metal, mostly iron, it's solid. Around it, there is a outer core, which is uh, of um, molten metal, and this core is the source for magnetic field around the Earth. The next goes a huge layer, which is called mantle, and that's volumetrically the biggest part of the Earth. And, on, and it's made out of rock, uh, rock at high pressures and temperatures. The topmost shell of the Earth is, uh, is uh, Earth's crust. 
And that crust is not actually a whole thing. It's not a kind of a whole shell, but it's rather it is divided on a number of plates. And in the um, figure at the bottom, you can see the map which shows the distribution of biggest tectonic plates on the surface of the Earth. These plates are always in the relative movement with respect to each other. They are moving because they can slide on top of a layer that is called asthenosphere. This layer is uh, located at about 100 to 200 kilometers depth. It is um, relatively it has relatively low viscosity because um, it has some molten rock in it. And so that's why the plates can kind of slide on this layer. Um, the plates move apart at, certain, at some places in the Earth and kind of collide together, move towards each other at other parts. So in this figure, this figure shows, um, this cartoon shows, uh, for example, on the right, where it says mid-ocean rise, for example. Uh, this is a divergent boundary between two plates. At this boundary, the plate uh, with the South America continent on it on the left and the plate with African continent on it uh, on the right, they are, these plates are moving apart from each other. In the left part of the cartoon, the two plates, one uh, the Pacific plate and the other plate with the uh, South America continent on it, these plates are moving together, moving uh, close to each other. And one plate, which has a lot of oceanic crust on it, the Pacific plate, it is denser than the other plate because it has a, the other plate has a continent on it which is buoyant. So the plate on the left starts to sink down into the mantle and below the other plate. That process is called subduction. The boundary between the plates uh, is called subduction, uh, sorry, uh, convergent boundary. Uh, subduction process is usually accompanied by a lot of activities such as volcanism, earthquakes, so that's what, happening, that's what happens in Japan, for example. Japan is uh, located in the huge subduction zone. So, well, what is driven this activity, very rigorous activity? Oh, by the way, the uh, kind of speed with which the plates are moving is about, uh, is on the order of from perhaps 10 to 50, 60 centimeters per year. So what is driving this activity? Well, we think that plate motion is driven by mantle convection. So the plate motion is something that we can observe, but the, our, the reasons for the plate motion is something that we actually theoreticize. This is our theory, that mantle convection is uh, a slow motion of the material within the mantle in response to the temperature gradients between the surface of the Earth and the core of the Earth. And this, is, this movement of material is something that you, happen, that you have, for example, uh, in a kettle that is about to boil. Uh, what happens is that uh, mantle rock, which is uh, at the bottom of the mantle, close to the surface in the center of this figure, um, this rock is extremely hot. As a result of it, it has a lower de density. It becomes to be gravitationally unstable and then ascends upwards towards the surface. As it approaches the surface, it starts to cool down. There, are, there happen some chemical um, differentiation processes. The mantle rock generates oceanic crust that comes to the surface. And all the material starts to move aside from the mid-oceanic reach, from the divergent boundaries, towards in both, to both sides from the boundary. And as it moves further and further away, that material starts to cool down, becomes heavier and heavier. And when the plate, that material approaches the, the other, the convergent boundary, for example, on the left and right of the figure, uh, all that material starts to sink back again within the mantle. That, that concludes the convection cell. Another important process that accompanies uh, these dynamics, the um, dynamics of mental convection, is a chemical process. Uh, this process is called chemical differentiation. And um, it happens uh, so that during this process, when the uh, 
hot mantle rock approaches the surface and produces oceanic crust. Uh, eventually, it also produces continental crust. But continental crustal rocks do not uh, never sink into back into the mantle. They because they have lower density. Um, they always float on top of the Earth. So during um, over the almost five billion years of Earth's evolution, we have quite a lot of crust, continental crust accumulated on the surface. That's where we live, actually, right? So that process um, was accompanied by gradual change in the composition of the entire mantle. And so with this introduction, I can now start talk talking about my first example of research in geosciences. Uh, this is example comes from uh, mental dynamics, geodynamics, and mental geochemistry. And as I said to you, mental convection theory is a theory. So we have some idea supported by data that we, by observation on the surface of the Earth, we have some idea about what's going on down there, but we don't really know that much. Um, so as usually happens, there are several uh, uh, competing theories about what is exactly the structure of convection. Some people believe that the, convection, the mantle convects as a whole. It doesn't have any layers within, within it. Other people believe that, well, that's not the case. There is a um, boundary somewhere in the layer, and perhaps only a part, only upper part of the, mount, of the mantle is convecting. And only that part is the source of all the continental crust that we have on the Earth. And that would mean that a lot of the mantle material is in fact secluded from the convection. So we would have uh, parts of mantle with very different chemical composition. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, just, here, just before we go into the example, can you just speak quickly about, in science, when is this border created between an idea and a theory? Like, when, when, because you spoke, mm -hmm. you said we have an idea, and then it, but it also becomes a theory. That um, is there a certain kind of yeah. collection? How much data is there? Like, a, um, all right. You know, of course, there's some data that makes it into a theory. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think I understand. Well, generally speaking, I'd say um, an idea becomes a theory in a scientific community as soon as it gets certain support from the community. When you have some scientists that say, well, we kind of believe in it, so we <laughs> maybe this is so, uh, and we can propose certain, uh, certain model, physical or numerical model that describes this process, then the idea becomes a theory. And there are usually some, in this case, for example, with the uh, structure of metal convection, these are competing theories, and so people would fight. Um, with each other. But before that, bef if it's just someone's idea about what's going on, uh, perhaps that wasn't a very good choice of words. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Um, so there's been a debate about what is the structure of mental convection. And the debate was, it was on for uh, more than 20 years. It's s to some extent, it's still on, but we hope that my co-authors and myself hope that we, to some extent, resolved at least partly this debate. Uh, and the debate was uh, so, um, so exciting because there were very strong arguments on both sides. And on the side of the whole mental convection, there was a, most of the community of geophysicists. Geophysicists, uh, well, they believe that, although we cannot really see with our eyes what's happening in the mantle, but they believe that they have uh, some data that allow them to kind of reconstruct what's going on down there. Uh, they have uh, seismic imaging techniques. Seismic waves are acoustic waves that are uh, produced by, for example, large earthquakes. Those waves travel through the entire Earth, and scientists, geophysicists can, they have tools uh, that help them to record those data and interpret it. Th those data so that they can uh, decipher what kind of obstacles those wa waves encountered during their trip through the Earth. So this is one of the models, uh, geophysical models of mantle based on seismic imaging. And it shows with red color, well, the box is basically the thickness, the entire thickness of the mantle. I think um, this 
shot is uh, under the Pacific plate. Uh, the red stuff here is uh, the mantle rock with relatively high temperatures. So in terms of mantle convection, that would be mantle material that ascends towards the surface because it's hot. The blue stuff is uh, material with relatively low temperatures. So that would be kind of subducting, uh, cold subducting material. So from these kind of models, we see that, well, there is no really discontinuity win within the mantle. We see that uh, the ascending rock goes from the bottom towards the surface, and the uh, descending rock goes towards the bottom. So that should mean that, well, the mantle should convect as a whole. <coughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, on the other side of the debate, there are geochemists who do not really care that much about um, seismic imaging. They, uh, what they care is real rocks. They would like to go into the field, collect certain samples, then go back to the laboratory, measure, look what kind of crystals they have within the rock, measure their chemical composition and so on, and that's their data, that's their truth. And they uh, realize that, of course, although we do not really have that many samples of uh, real mantle, but we have some mantle-derived rocks at certain parts of the Earth. On the one hand, there are those mid-ocean ridges, the divergent boundaries that I was t telling you about. Uh, because we have that mantle material that is coming from depth towards the surface, the rocks in mid-oceanic ridges are mantle-derived. So we can, from those, their composition, we can guess what should be the composition of the source mantle. On the other, the other hand, we have uh, oceanic islands. And those are very interesting constructions. Oceanic islands, for example, Hawaii, um, they are in fact huge volcanoes with very, very deep roots underneath them. And we know that those volcanoes sample mantle and usually from great depth. Uh, so from compositions of the rocks from those islands, we can also guess, uh, we can also construct the chemical composition of the source mantle. So when geochemists compare the two, they find that, well, they have different compositions. Mantle uh, as a source for those rocks should have very different compositions in those places. And it seems that that oceanic island rocks uh, come from primitive mantle. They have a more enriched composition. So in this cartoon, that what is when it's where it says OIB, these are oceanic island rocks. And kind of it shows the volcano that taps into the primitive mantle. And uh, mid-oceanic ridges, uh, they sample rocks from the depleted mantle, from the convecting mantle that was depleted through the process of uh, the genera generation of continental crust. So this is the first strong argument for layered convection. Then they, that's not it. They have another argument for layered convection. And um, that argument is a actually a number of calculations, which are called global mass balance. Um, in this cartoon, I, this is just a conceptual kind of diagram that shows you the relationship between primitive mantle, the convecting or present-day mantle, and continental crust. So as I said before, um, we believe that the mantle that we had at the perhaps four, about four billion years ago, before all the continental crust appeared, that mantle had relatively enriched composition in many elements. Then all mantle or part of the mantle that started to convect uh, produced continental crust. Chemically, this process fractionates many elements so that some elements, for example, uh, uranium, thorium, uh, some other elements, they pref preferentially enter continental crust. So the convecting mantle is very much depleted in those elements. If we uh, knew the compositions of primitive mantle, of convecting mantle, and continental crust, and compare all the, the kind of masses of the material within these three boxes, we could then say whether entire mantle is depleted or only part of it is depleted. So that such calculations show that we have to have a huge part of the mantle secluded from mantle convection because there is not enough stuff in the present day convecting mantle to account for all that material that we think primitive mantle should have had. So, well, 
as always, if we have a debate in scientific uh, community, this generates a lot of research, and usually in, at both sides of a debate. So in, ge in geophysics, uh, it brought about refinement of seismic imaging techniques. People revised their assumptions for their models. They also tried to develop better computer codes and so on. In geochemistry, people started to try to collect more and more data. They also uh, refine their chemical uh, measurements. They try to develop better models of evolution. And uh, my co-author and myself also became interested in this, um, in this problem. So we looked at both sides of this debate, at uh, all the arguments on the both sides. And at some point, we uh, became really interested in the geochemical parts of the argument, uh, and uh, especially in this, those mass, mass global calcul sorry global mass balance calculations. Um, we noticed that a very important part of those calculations is that um, assumed model, theoretical model of the primitive mantle composition. And we became really interested in that. So we looked at what kind of model exists there of the uh, primitive mantle. Our primitive mantle, um, of course, is uh, all the material that is in the Earth except for the core. Right, because in the very early Earth, uh, when the core al already extracted, the core is uh, generally just iron with some impurities. So all the rest of the stuff is in the mantle, uh, in the primitive mantle. So when we are talking about the composition of the primitive mantle, in fact, we are talking about the composition of the Earth as a planet. And I'm not going to go into details here of all the available models of the primitive mantle. Um, Suffice to say is that McDonald's son from 1995, there was the uh, current model at the time, two or three years ago when we did that uh, work, and uh, it's been mostly cited. It was the base for all the mass global mass balance calculations and many other applications. So I am going to talk a little bit about that model. So if you think of it, it's such an interesting question, right? How do we know the chemical composition of it? of the Earth as a planet, right, of the entire body. And especially if we think that the primitive mantle is something that may not exist anymore already, if we have uh, depleted mantle and continental crust and so on. So what is how to define the composition of something that may not be there even? Well, McDonough and Sun uh, realized that if we collect some mantle-derived data and plot those data in geochemical space such as this on this cartoon on the x-axis you have you have one chemical element and the ratio of two other elements on the vertical axis so if we plot those data on in this kind of space despite the scatter you can see certain trends right certain trends within the data that can be fitted loosely fitted to a regression to a line those trends McDonald and Sun believed um, are the results of those processes of chemical differentiation of the primitive material. So it seems that the primitive mantle composition should be here somewhere in this plot uh, and moreover on this melting trend. But then uh, the compositions of, uh, d as a result of the uh, extraction of continental crust and all the other processes, um, mantle rock started to have different compositions generally along those trends. So if we had any means to kind of locate this single point on melting trends, uh, then that would give us the primitive mantle composition. So there is something, okay, we have the melting trends, but we are missing just one bit of a puzzle where how to locate this just single one single point. It can be to the left, to the right, or in the center. Um, and it turns out that we do have this uh, bit of a puzzle, and it comes from extraterrestrial data. And I, here I should give you a short, make a short digression into the uh, solar system formation theory. So, well, we believe that solar system um, originated from a nebula, from a cloud of interstellar gas and dust that was disturbed and then started to collapse gravitationally. This resulted in um, the appearance of a protostar in the center of the nebula, and the rest of the material accreted into a kind of accretion lens around it. Um, the material within this accretion disk um, 
was rotating and gravitationally growing all that with time. Uh, so that after certain uh, millions years, uh, those little tiny particles uh, collided into bigger and bigger bits and then they became uh, so-called planetesimals or protoplanets and those from the collision of those protoplanets uh, the planets that we have now appeared well if you think of it it means that most of the solar system appeared from just a kind of uniform stuff right that was <laughs> there around and if we could sample um, some th material from say it's the stages c and d that would give us an idea of the composition of the Earth as a whole, as a body. And we do have this material. We have meteorites. Um, geologists collected uh, quite a large number of data on meteorites. And uh, we know that there are several different classes of meteorites. And one of those classes, um, so-called primitive meteorite or chondrites, those meteorites um, are thought to come from about stage E, perhaps. On this, on this cartoon, um, ge uh, geochemists discovered that if they measure ratios of certain values in uh, chondritic and primitive meteorites, mm -hmm. those values would be almost identical for those all those meteorites. The elements we are talking about are called refractory. They are very sturdy. Those are the elements that accreted last during the uh, solar system formation. So it's um, it's only natural to assume that those ratios, ratios should be the same in the Earth as a planet, too. So we could use that as a constraint in our search for the primitive mental composition. So with this, if we go back to McDonough and Sun plots, we have the trends, right? Uh, if we have the chondritic values of ratios of those elements, for example, calcium and deuterium, the intersection of that value with the linear regression or with the trend, melting trend in periodotites, in mantle-derived rocks, would give us the primitive mantle composition. So this is it. This is the model that we had. It's a beautiful idea. It's an interesting model. It's a um, great work. But because we have a debate, we have to go back to all the models and just think over everything and see whether um, anything can be done just a little bit better, whether maybe just something could be um, changed so that we have a certain resolution of our problems, of our debate. And we did that. We um, looked again at their data. We looked at the way they dealt with this data. And we realized that, well, you see on these images, there is so much scatter. They try to fit the linear regression, this kind of a, they, to, OK, ask me questions if it's not clear. But by linear regression, I mean just the line that approximates the direction in this data in a, uh, the best possible way. So you can see, because there is a scatter in this data, this line can go a little bit further to the right or to the left. It's really hard to say where it goes, right? So that means that. Um, the primitive mental composition for in with such data is not quite certain then, right? Uh, well, what we did is that we decided not to look at all those elements one by one, but look at all that mass of data in multidimensional space for a number of elements. So we have 11 or 12 elements, and we looked at all that data simultaneously. And we found out, well, we used quite a number of different mathematical and statistical techniques. I'm not going to go into details here, but just um, to give you an idea, we realized, we, we found out how to find a single variable in that multidimensional space of different chemical elements that approximates in a really well, nice way uh, all that data and the, mm, all the data in all those elements, compositions. That uh, variable we called Q, it uh, is um, this variable sort of reflects the amount of melting of the primitive mantle. Um, then we imposed all our chondritic constraints. We also did um, use a really fancy uh, statistical method, which is called Monte Carlo bootstrap technique, in order to uh, determine a very, uh, in a very precise way the uncertainty of our estimates. 
And um, these are the results. Uh, so because we used these statistical methods, the results are in the form of probability functions. So the maximum of those functions um, give us the best estimates of the abundance of elements, of these elements in the mantle. And uh, from the comparison with the previous models, you see that for some elements, the estimates, the old um, estimates and our estimates are kind of similar, but for others there is a there is a certain difference. So we were curious to see whether it would give uh, us um, any interesting results in terms of the uh, geochemical arguments for layered convection. Well, and it did. Um, in the top here on the left, you see again that same diagram. We have primitive mantle, convective mantle, or present day mantle, and con continental crust. If the primitive mantle composition matches the sum of continental crust and uh, convective mantle compositions, then the entire mantle convects. If it doesn't, then the variable here in the box, PM minus CC over DM, that means primitive mantle minus continental crust over depleted mantle, if that variable is much bigger than one, then it means that we have a problem. We need to have a huge reservoir of stuff somewhere in the mantle. And the results, uh, the comparison of the results in the, for the older model and for our model is on the right here. On the horizontal axis, we have different chemical elements, such as radioactive elements, thorium, and uranium, and some other elements. The blue field is the results for all the model. You see so that for those elements, like uranium, the variable for McDonald and Sun model is uh, uh, somewhere from perhaps 2.5 to 6. So it means that we have to have a lot of that stuff secluded somewhere in the mantle. For our model, within the uncertainty, and the uncertainty is large, but that's something that we have in our data, within the uncertainty, that variable is about one or slightly bigger than one for most of the elements. And if it's slightly bigger than one, that's not a problem from the uh, point of view of uh, mental geodynamics, because well, we m still might have some pockets of the primitive mantle uh, or some kind of blobs of enriched materials, um, which, for, which, by the way, sh should be sampled by oceanic islands, by those deep-rooted volcanoes. But we don't have to have the whole half of the mantle secluded from mantle convection. So this kind of um, resolves the, the um, inconsistency. We still can have... A, uh, whole mantle convection from geophysical point of view because we have stuff coming from the bottom and sinking to the bottom. But from geochemical point of view, there should be, there might still be stuff that is not quite well mixed in the mantle, but we don't have to have the layering. We don't have to have two, um, two separated reservoir within the reservoirs within the mantle. So that was our exciting uh, result. We also, it also had some other applications which I'm not going to talk about today. And if we have more time, I can move to the second example. It's, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> and um, my second example, which is, um, I hope, I think is also very interesting, but very different, is um, from other fields of geosciences. It's mostly petrology and metamorphic geology and also geophysics. And here, it's very different. We are not looking at the uh, huge microscopic planetary scale things and processes. We are looking at, looking at relatively um, local um, processes such as mountain formation. And uh, in geological terms, mountain systems are called collisional orogenies. They are believed to happen as a result of uh, the collision of different tectonic plates, of two tectonic plates. So for example, on the top, uh, the top part of the cartoon, you see the subduction zone. You see how two plates collide with each other. One plate with the oceanic crust on it sinks into the mantle below the other plate. And on the bottom part of the cartoon, we see that at the late stages of the subduction, it sometimes happens that all the oceanic crust um, has sunk 
down into the ma mantle by the continental crust and the um, oceanic islands on the two plates uh, are have collided and fo folded as a result of the continuing, colli continuing collision of the two plates. So this process creates, uh, um, creates mountain systems. For example, it happened in Himalayas or in Alps. Uh, and there are certain questions. Well, there are certain models that describe the process and the chemistry and physics of that process. But also, there are certain questions. And as usual, there are certain inconsistencies between the predicted, uh, our theoretical predictions and empirical data. So for example, uh, based on theory, we believe that fluid, and fluid is basically that's water, um, all the, most of the rocks within the uh, continental crust contain uh, pretty large amounts of fluid that is moving through those rocks, uh, and that's water and CO2. Um, so based on theoretical considerations, we believe that that water should move mostly towards the surface in the direction of decrease in temperature. On the other hand, if when we look at the empirical data at petrology of certain uh, rocks, we see that we see indications that fluid flow in those rocks went into the direction of increasing temperature. So that's one problem. Then the other problem is that, well, it turns out to be really hard to theoretically model the high temperatures that are observed in the mountain chain rocks. So in this cartoon, um, this plot rather, uh, on Horizontal axis is temperature, on vertical axis is depth, and the pink shape shows the kind of the range of data, range of empirical data from different geological localities. It shows the pressures and temperatures that are observed within the rocks in those uh, in those places, and the blue arrows show the models, the predicted pressures and temperatures uh, based on our numerical models of. Uh, um, orogeny of collisions. Well, there is quite a uh, difference between the, the two kinds of data. So this is another problem that motivates the research. So what we did is we constructed uh, <coughs> two-dimensional numerical models that approximated the physical and chemical evolution of uh, mountain chains after the collision. And um, on top, the, the um, cartoon on top shows the geometry of our model. And the kind of dark green wedge uh, is our mountain system. So if you have a difficulty seeing a mountain, uh, mountain chain there, so I, I have this cartoon. But well, the thing is that our numerical models can, at least at this point, can never reproduce or have difficulties at least reproducing the real life topography of mountains. So what we have to do is we have to assume that we have flat mountains that, have, um, that are at about five kilometers elevation uh, from the surface of the earth. And um, we have to specify a number of different variables such as temperature, such as the amount of radiogenic elements and so on and so on. We have to specify the porosity, the number of the amount of space within the rocks through which the fluid would move. Um, the difference of our models from, uh, compared to the previous one is that we also included metamorphic reactions. We included chemical reactions in our rocks that may produce or uh, um, either produce or kind of collect fluid from the surrounding rock um, within our model. And um, after having formulated, so having set up the geometry of the model, we then have to go and write down the fundamental equations. So whenever we have um, a research in physics, we start with uh, writing the equations. That's kind of a fundamental theory. Um, you, your ground base from which you have to build up everything else. So um, as all, usually those equations are energy conservation, mass conservation, momentum conservation. They can be uh, formulated differently for different problems. Um, because those equations are very difficult to solve for uh, big models, 
we, we do not really attempt even to solve them uh, analytically. We have to solve them numerically uh, on such grid as shown on the right of this picture. So this is, these are solved just by brutal numerical force. And the results of such models are in the form of such maps, distributions of certain parameters in the space of our geological, uh, of our numerical model. So for example, on top, you see the thick solid lines show the isotherms, the distribution of temperature, and the tiny little arrows show the direction of the fluid flow in the rocks in our models. And uh, well, we found out that for some model parameters, we, our results are similar to the previous results. Uh, most of the fluid, as you can see from the arrows, move uh, towards the surface in the direction of decreasing, I'm sorry, decreasing temperature. But because our models also included metamorphic reactions, we found out some cases in which the fluid would go downwards um, from the surface into the depth as a result of those reactions. So that was exciting results because um, that's actually what we observe in the field and we couldn't explain it numerically before. As for the temperatures, well, um, as I said, in the field, we have indications of very high temperatures in the mountain rocks. For example, the map on the right is from Scotland. Um, those, the colors show different uh, mineralogical compositions of the rocks, of different rocks in that area. The kind of bluish, greenish colors are for the rocks with low temperatures, relatively low temperatures, and yellow, orange, and red show the rocks with uh, relatively high temperatures. The nice picture on the left is, in fact, link, a link between our theory and observation. So in the field, what we observe is those different mineral compositions. Uh, for example, um, well, based on the mineral compositions, we then, with the help of the chart on the left, we can determine pressures and temperatures at, those, at which those rocks were, uh, were generated. For example, the uh, large pink field on the top in the right-hand corner is a field of all the rocks that are made of garnet and biotite, just two minerals. And we know that those rocks should be produced at temperatures of about something more than 600 degrees and pressures of about uh, more than one GPA. So these kind of correspondences let us allow us to go from the observations in the field, from the real rock compositions, to the temperatures and pressures, which then can be uh, compared with our numerical predictions. So, well, what uh, do we have when we compare our predictions with data? Again, we have um, data on the right, the map from Scotland with different mineral compositions. And you can see that in the center of this zone, there is a huge bunch of um, kind of orange material. And that's, and in the very center, you have kind of reddish stuff. And that those are all the rocks with a relatively high temperature, sometimes more than 600 degrees. On the our t on our theoretical predictions, in the left, you don't see those fields. We couldn't reproduce them. So that, that was an initial problem with our models. Well, as always, when we have these kind of problems, we, well, we reconsider our model. We see, well, maybe there was something that we didn't take into account. So we went, we made some literature search, looked at what are the reasons for um, for the kind of missing hit in our models could be. And uh, there was quite a number of these, but one of them was magmatism and associated fluid flow, magmatism basically. So we realized after looking again at the data, at our empirical data from Scotland, we realized that in this area and in many other mountain chains, there is quite a number, quite a large number of big magmatic intrusions. intrusions. And by the way, by magmatism, I mean uh, the intrusion of hot lava or hot molten rock from the mantle into the continental crust. That hot stuff brings with it a lot of heat, so it kind of heats up the continental crust. Uh, what we see in the field, what we see in real life is a 
solidified bodies of uh, magma, which intruded in the continental crust sometime very long ago, and then gradually cooled down and solidified. But we still uh, can and identify those um, those things in the field. So from the map, you see that there is a lot. There are a lot of intrusions. That means that. Well, of course, we have to try to incorporate them in our models and see whether it will make any difference for our predictions of the temperature. And when we did that, this our theoretical prediction, uh, kind of updated prediction, is on the left. So you see that now we have quite a lot of material with very high temperatures of about of more than 800 degrees. We also have silimonite zone around that material and uh, some other ma minerals with uh, relatively high temperatures that are observed in um, mountain chains and in particular in Scotland. And there are some other uh, correspondences between our model predictions and and empirical data from Scotland, although our models were not even intended to be a reconstruction of the situation in Scotland. They just happened to give a really nice predictions for, um, for the uh, collisional origins that could be then compared with uh, uh, the case of Scotland. And um, as a conclusion, I just want to show again this slide from the beginning of my lecture. And, uh, the relationship, this kind of constant oscillation between theory and empirical data that happens all the time in research when we strive to bring the two together by refining both the theory and our measurements and experiments. And this is it. Thank you. was a byproduct from listening to you to become really aware that most of these models are um, created through collaborative processes. So there's always yeah. two names, right? All these things that most of them, I think you showed, have two names attached. Can you speak a little bit about um, the importance of um, a collaborative thinking process in science? Oh, it is very important, especially in, especially in empirical sciences. I think. It's not quite the case for, say, mathematics. Um, there are many people in mathematics who prefer to work on their own, <laughs> although they, they sometimes work in groups, but that doesn't happen very often. But in uh, empirical sciences, especially in geosciences, yes, it is, a, it is habitual to have more than one uh, person working on a project, usually because it takes expertise of more than one person to work on a project, especially if the project is as these projects are in the boundaries between different subfields. So you would have a kind of a geophysicist and geochemist collaborating on a single project or on a single problem. Or sometimes you have more people if you have a, um, a group that is working in a laboratory and which tries to reproduce certain conditions. So then you have a whole list of names. So that. That is usually the case for uh, empirical sciences. I think it's same, the same for um, biology uh, and physics. So it's a good question. Yeah, that's true. Uh, those uh, works that are made by one person tend to be kind of theoretical, uh, kind of theories proposed uh, in a Mm, for rather not even for explanation of certain data, but just certain proposed theories, so, so say solution for for kind of physical puzzles or something. But if it's a, a research that involves both data and theory and kind of going back and forth, that would re usually require more than one person. Yes. What's the longest live theory that's out there that they're waiting for the results to come in to match? And are you working with it with the assumption that it's going to be okay? Or they're questioning it, maybe it's not okay, but 
It's still fun. Hmm. It's an interesting question. Maybe Newtonian physics was, right? Yeah. Uh, from like 18th century till the beginning of 20th century. But uh, the lifespan, well, it depends actually on the field, of course, and the, on the scope of your theories. If it's like not something huge as relativistic f physics, well, here, for example, there are kind of a smaller, smaller sort of theories and bigger theories. Uh, there could be a theory for, um, which describes mental convection, the dynamics of it. Then we could talk about a theory that is just talking about the evolution of mental, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the mountain chain evolution and so on and so on. So depending on the scope of the uh, theory, it also has different kind of life expectations. Um, usually it's, Many are pretty stable, so about most of the theories, for example, all the platic about the platic tonics, there's been a consensus for many years, and it doesn't seem that there will be any surprises here because we have so much, um, such a huge n amount of data that supports uh, the platic tonics, especially with the advent of GPS. So we now, with the help of GPS, we can really measure the velocities at which plates are moving. I don't know if it, that answers your question, so I guess it was. Uh, I, would, I would suspect space something to do with, we can't quite find out yet, but we have a pretty good idea something out there. Oh, you mean? Works the way uh, it, it should work. Hmm. And then you get surprised with Saturn and things like that. Yes, it, it happens. For example, um, it happens in uh, geophysics and geochemistry that based on physics, people would predict that there should be phase transformation within the rocks at certain depths so that they, they would change their uh, behavior and composition, but they do not have yet any uh, empirical data to support those theories because people could not yet reproduce those um, conditions in the lab. So they can only uh, assume that, that this is what must be happening. Um, Another example is the example that I was just talking about with the uh, directions of the fluid flow. We, we have certain models that describe how the fluid, numerical but also just theoretical based on first principles in physics, uh, that, for example, say that we should, perhaps if we have an isotropy in the crust, if we have, say, a layer within the crust that is impermeable, then we should have a lot of fluid going uh, underneath this layer, but not going percolating through it, right? And sometimes uh, it's hard to find the support, kind of that situation in real life that um, shows you that this is happening, you know, as in a concrete geological localities. So, yeah, it, it's often the case that we have idea, we have theories about what's going on, but we don't yet have data that supports them. I. I guess I, it's hard to answer about the kind of long uh, lifetime of those theories just because it's so um, changing all the time. A question about the nature of data. And, and mm -hmm. you, I think early on you spoke about the goal of science to come to some conclusion or con to con conform with theories. Isn't there a space where you would actually not want to reach that? position where you would have to acknowledge that data can be interpreted in different ways and one data, one piece of evidence is not actually always static and the same and non-mutable. In other words, isn't there a pitfall to try to come up with a stable theory or a, a consensus or a conforming um, theoretical construct for many different phenomena? Or is that, the, the is that an impulse that comes that is counter empirical science? Well, philosophically speaking, it might be the case, but practically it never happens uh, because, uh, like, the complexity of nature is such that uh, we never have a situation that we we have a theory that, that explains away like everything. There are always there is always work uh, in order to uh, kind of. Uh, fit something to something. There is always, even a theory that, that is working for a number of phenomena, uh, there is always a kind of uh, a gray area where it's not clear what's going on or whether maybe the theory is, uh, is not quite what we 
um, it's not quite working or maybe the data are not right or maybe we don't have enough data. So, uh, I didn't yeah. mean so much in the sense of kind of an overarching, you know, almost spiritual theory or entity, but more in the sense of the intention of why would one want to have a oh. consistent theory that can be applied or shared or, 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 or agreed to by different scientists? Well, but that's just um, kind of the definition of science. Th this is the goal of science. If it were not the case, if that was not the goal, that wouldn't be science anymore. Because the goal of science is uh, to try to explain the natural phenomena or to propose a theory that explains them. Then uh, explaining here means uh, finding conformity between our theory and data. If we didn't want to do that, if we didn't want that conformity, we wouldn't be doing science, we would be doing something else. So that's just the question of definition. So I, for philosophers, that could be a question. So they could um, have doubts about what, are, what should be the real, the real goals of science and so on. But from the practical point of view in science, we, we just want to explain the phenomena in the best way we can. And we, it's, um, it doesn't happen usually that we say that, all right, I will explain till this point and then I don't care anymore. No, we, we, if we have questions, we try to settle them, right? But it's an interesting philosophical question. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> this is a very difficult question. Yeah. Well, I find the two activities very different in their goals. Um, and that actually relates to your question, too, because uh, in science, there are objective criteria uh, that sh tell us whether our research is mm -hmm. progressing or not. We, we have that, we can always check whether uh, there is a conformity, there is a misfit or not, or like uh, higher or lower conformity between theory and data. Um, in art, we do not have uh, such objective criteria. Um, aesthetic criteria are less objective, that rather some people believe they are subjective, absolutely subjective. So um, you do not, you there is no way you can test your perception, your aesthetic um, feeling. Um, there are no other ways to test it. It's, it's something that you feel or you don't feel, right? There are some similarities maybe, for example, in the process, although. For example, while I was working on this um, presentation, I thought that these oscillations between theory and data, like kind of going back and forth and uh, checking one, um, comparing one with another all the time, that is not unlike um, what's happening f in the art for people who practice it, when they have to go back between their concept, the, their idea, and the, um, their particular work or the material with which they're struggling. So you kind of go back and forth. You, you, um, at one point you focus on your material, you see what it, you figure out what it says to you, what it's doing with you, uh, for you, and then you go back to your ideas and see what you want to really say um, for yourself, and then you go back to the material again, and so on and so on. So this kind of oscillation between two poles is, uh, I think, not unlike what's uh, happening in empirical sciences in research, but that's from practical point of view, kind of in terms of practice. Um, philosophically, I think there are more differences uh, than the similarities just because um, science is so objective. We have kind of outside criteria that tell us whether we are wrong or not, or we hope we do <laughs> have those criteria. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the use of your diagrams themselves uh, in 
maybe uh, thinking about the last question, and, and, and I'm kind of wondering if you could just talk about the actual diagrams themselves and creation of the diagrams and hmm. your use of them. Um, interesting. Well, this is, for example, this cartoon um, is taken from other, from Thomas Kuhn's essay. The diagrams that I myself created, um, such as this at the bottom of the cartoon. Well, it's not really that I created this diagram. It's a kind of byproduct of my work. That's and this is a, actually <laughs> it's a very interesting point. Usually, diagrams, in most of the cases in r scientific research, uh, the visuals, the diagrams, the plots, and so on, they are just kind of byproducts or they are vis visualization of data that you, d you don't have to have them, right? For actually, say, even that, this kind of plot that. Um, summarizes a lot of petrological data, uh, temperatures and pressures for number of different rocks at different localities. This is just a summary so that we don't have to, of course, we could put a, um, we could make a table with all those numbers and just look at the tables and that would eventually give us the same information. But just for the sake of um, convenience, we use um, plots and diagrams and there are certain traditions, certain uh, ways of creating diagrams that are traditional, that like people keep doing and will be doing forever. They do it in textbooks and so on. For example, um, well, here, the depth is vertical. And that's just because, uh, and if you go to geological uh, or geophysical papers, you would always see uh, depth or pressure on vertical axis just because it approximates kind of the depth of the Earth. Right, Th things like this, they're just conventional. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's, this is, I guess, it. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's a very interesting question, thank you. I never thought of it. <laughs> it kind of, I have a follow up on this because it's, there's something though um, that is very important that the data is, becomes um, visualized or materialized outside of thought, right? There is something really important. I mean, you do it through language in writing about it, but also very much through, through these, you know, diagrams and, and things like that. I, I find it very interesting because it, the importance of that, I did some research at some point around this, this notion of infinity hmm. and how many people have tried to, I mean, we have a symbol, right, the kind of, that is infinite, but there's I think Da Vinci, if I'm not mistaken, tried to produce a machine of like wheels that go smaller and smaller so that the movement gets slower and slower and slower so that the last wheel of it is like looks to us as if it's still but it's infinitely slow. And the kind of obsession about um, visualizing, materializing these ideas, I, I don't know, it seems something that's interesting interesting, not that I want to force on this relationship between art and science, but I think it's really interesting for me in looking at all your diagrams and the, the need of that, the need of the materialization. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, in fact, that probably, it may be very important, it's just that we do not really appreciate it uh, in uh, the field of science. We do not, we're not used to think about it this, in this way. Mm -hmm. um, we just, look at it as a kind of a tool that is very unimportant. Although, of course, people do pay a lot of attention to making um, their plots or diagrams look really nice for publication, for example, because, of course, this, this um, has a relevance to how people will accept those uh, papers. So people will try to make their data and their results very legible, very easy to understand by readers. But that's basically the only thing they're, thing they're thinking about. But um, yeah, it's a fascinating <laughs> um, thing to think about. <laughs> Any more questions? Then maybe we, we wrap it up here in the public part. Thank you. Thank you.